Betty, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're excited to have you. Um, we hope that you find this webinar informative. Um, the topic is going to be about evidence-based practices um, and how that impacts domestic violence advocates and child welfare professionals and really um, all individuals that are part of the system, various systems of care. Before we uh, really get started with the conversation, I'd love to hear who's in the room. So if you wouldn't mind taking a quick poll for me, it would really help me um, gauge my examples for you later in the conversation. Okay, fantastic. Well, it looks like um, we have a lot of domestic violence advocates represented, um, as well as individuals from the child welfare system, plus some attorneys, um, individuals from culturally specific community-based programs. We, we love when you join us. Um, uh, healthcare profession, um, faith-based, mental health uh, uh, professionals, fantastic. So I hope that you find this conversation um, interesting. And um, please uh, feel free to uh, chime in into the chat box when you have a question. The plan for today is really to discuss three main things. It's really to di dissect the difference between practice-based evidence and evidence-based practice. I'm really going to rely heavily on the former of those, but it's, it's important to um, disentangle those two topics. And then I'll also talk about why both of them are, are, are very important to both fields, child welfare and domestic violence. We're going to be, um, I'm going to be giving you some examples of common practices. I looked for practices that really um, kind of hover between child welfare and domestic violence um, so that they would be applicable to um, all individuals participating, but um, we really can have several conversations about the practices um, and treatments that are out there and uh, available to uh, DV survivors and to their children. Then by the end, I'm going to give you a list, really a slew of resources. There are quite a few out there to educate individuals about evidence-based practice, but more importantly than that, um, I'm going to um, inform you about what the Resource Center on Domestic Violence, Child Protection and Custody that falls under the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges can do for you and how we can assist you if you're interested in evaluating some of your programs or practices, maybe even your policies. We've done uh, quite a bit of work on that as well. Forgive me, my computer is a little slow. All right, um, I was hoping you'd answer one more question for me. Um, I'd, I'd like to have a better understanding of how often you discuss evidence-based practices or programs within your own organization. How often is this a topic in staff meetings or when you go out in the community and when you're serving um, community members or working um, with other organizations? Okay, it looks like we have about 50% of individuals saying that, um, you know, this is a conversation that happens most of the time, if not all the time, which is, which is really nice to hear. Um, I hope that the information that I provide to you isn't redundant to um, information that you're already aware of. Um, so um, let's see, we have one more question for you. And this is really an attitude question. You know, I feel comfortable discussing criteria needed for programs and practices to be considered evidence-based. Wow, fantastic. Okay, so about 80%, maybe, you know, actually about 86% of you are agreeing with that statement or strongly agreeing. So that's very good to hear. I know that there's been a conscious effort to really talk about evidence-based work um, over the last few years. So it's nice to hear um, that it's getting out to the field. 
All right, so very quickly, um, I wanted to provide you with some definitions and some examples. The difference between evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence. Um, sometimes, sometimes we don't talk about practice-based evidence enough. Our focus really is on EBPs. Um, but what, what is practice-based evidence? Um, it's when a practitioner or a professional out in the field really uses their skills, their experience, and their expertise to make decisions about how to respond to their client and their client's needs. Um, it's really informed by contextual information, right? So these individuals really have one-on-one -on -one contact uh, with their clients. They have a better understanding of what they're going through, their situation, possibly the traumas, various traumas that they've experienced. Um, and even their environment in which they live, and those who are available to support them, right? So that's all uh, valuable information. Um, sometimes what's lacking in practice-based evidence is actual data to show that a practitioner or professional made a certain decision, um, moved forward with that decision um, on how to serve their client, and then that's sort of where we lose the information. Was their next step effective or not? Um, so that's why EBPs are so important. They emphasize the importance of evaluation to determine effectiveness in anything you do. When you see evaluated, think data, right? There's some type of data. It can be qualitative data. It can be quantitative data. Um, but it was collected in some type of systematic form so that you really um, can have a gauge as to whether uh, your efforts are working or whether they aren't. So where do um, EBPs really fit um, in our conversation? I think the best way of describing this is a Venn diagram. So you'll see that green circle really represents the published literature. So the published research, the quote, um, evidence that we have um, much based on theory um, that we can rely on, on information, programs and practices that have happened in the past and what we know about them. But you'll see that purple circle right below is equally as important. That's where I really would um, um, place practice-based evidence. It's the expertise of practitioners and professionals that come into play that need to have a voice in these conversations, right? Um, we don't live in a bubble, so we have to, it's crucial that we interact with each other um, and collaborate for our best efforts to come to fruition. And then the blue circle is pivotal. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the client's voice is lacking in a lot of our research or in a lot of our work. So here at the council, we really emphasize the importance to our family court judges and our juvenile court judges to hear from their client, whether it be a parent in their courtroom or a youth in a detention setting. But um, the best information that you're going to get in regards to their needs and um, some future next steps is literally from the client, and I'm sure all of you know that. Another element that isn't discussed often is the environment, so the context in which all this happens. So it's not only um, the environment in which the client lives, but it's the environment in which a service is provided, um, all kinds of elements, including transportation. If you want a client to um, use a particular service, how are they going to get there? We know that um, many of our clients really fall under an underserved population that don't have a lot of means available to them, so we need to help them as much as possible. In regards to evidence-based practice, it falls right in the middle there. So it's the combination of all these factors because we have to give credit where credit is due. All these um, elements give us um, additional information, additional pieces to the puzzle so we have a better understanding of where uh, that client's needs are. So the conversation about evidence-based practice really started um, with the Center for D Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC has done some fabulous work under their veto violence um, initiative um, to provide information for audiences to really better understand evidence and what it entails. 
Um, I would really, if you haven't done so already, I'd really encourage you to visit this website. It has some great training opportunities to, for you that discuss evidence in a very um, um, palliable way. Um, real world examples with um, identifying exactly where stake, uh, stakeholders' input is important. It gives examples of using contextual evidence. Sometimes people don't think of this. This is you know, local data sources. Um, sometimes you want to make sure that you have all the right people around the table. And many of them, many of their organizations and systems collect data um, that sometimes answer your questions. Um, but without starting those conversations, you'll never know. So that type of data, that local data sources, is really secondary data. You don't play any role in collecting it or altering the questions that are asked or the type of data that's collected. But you may have it readily available um, with some um, uh, memorandums of understanding and some collaborative uh, initiatives. The website also has resources, videos, and case studies, um, and information about resource centers, which is fantastic. But the one element on this website that I'm really going to focus on today is their continuum uh, for evidence of effectiveness. The CDC does a great job of recommending that evaluation of effectiveness is really done on a continuum, ranging from well-supported to harmful programs and practices. They stress that this is not a dichotomy. It's not a yes-no. It's definitely not black or white. There's all kinds of things that fall in the middle. This is an example of their interactive chart that you can find on that web link above. Um, as you hover e over each of these boxes, it gives you a nice description of what they're talking about, and it even gives you some uh, resources that you can access via uh, your internet browser. I'm not going to go over all of these today, but the reason I brought this up was to emphasize that when we talk about evidence-based practice, this is where we want to fall. In for programs and practices that are really well supported or supported through experimental designs of some sort that have shown to be effective over time. And um, down here um, on this column, highlighted in orange, is the importance of replication. We'll talk about that in a little more detail in the next slide. Um, but that, this, these are some of the elements that really set evidence-based practice um, apart from others. Now, I've done much of the literature. Um, we often work with collaborative partners across the nation. And we were recently working with our colleagues at Futures Without Violence to investigate what the literature says about all types of programs and practices related to domestic violence and child welfare. What I ended up finding out was really that much of our work, some of the common practices and programs that we, um, that we urge um, jurisdictions to move forward with really at this time fall under promising and emerging practices. That's not a bad thing. It means that um, we are working our way towards evidence-based practice, which is extremely important. Um, you know, we are um, conducting maybe non-experimental designs. Um, we have single group designs. We're doing a lot of exploratory work to see what programs and practices may be effective. This finding really isn't surprising. We've really, had, we've really started the conversation about the intersection between domestic violence and child welfare about 20 years ago. At that time, the conversation about the importance of data really hadn't begun yet. It's been in more recent years. So it's not surprising to really find the state of the literature under this middle section. And like I said earlier, it's not a bad thing. We're moving in the right direction. What we want to be concerned with is this last section, um, programs and practices that have either been shown to be unsupported, so we really don't know if they're positive or negative, or those that have actually harmful effects. We want to be careful that um, these types of programs are, are evaluated quickly and monitored, and we discontinue use of them. Or if we really question the results, we replicate just to double check um, our data. But we definitely don't want to be in this last column. We're, um, we're leaning more towards promising and emerging, and hopefully in the very near future, supported and well-supported. 
This is another diagram we've created for you um, just to show that the plan here is to move up, just like I stated earlier. Um, and what we're really finding is that we fall somewhere from emerging to well-supported in the literature right now, depending on what type of program or practice you're talking about. What's really important about this particular slide is that emerging, promising, supported, and well-supported, those four categories have one commonality. There is some discussion of theory as the organization moves forward with their program or practice. Now, you may be saying, well, what exactly is a theory? A theory is formulated to explain or predict or understand a particular phenomenon. What we want to limit with our programs and practice is that we move forward based on assumptions, right, without any support. So we really uh, depend on the literature to give us some direction to start with. Now, you'll note that um, well-supported literature has an experimental design and has some replic replication attached to that. We'll, so we'll speak more about that in a minute. And you'll note that supported work has an empirical um, evidence attached to that. We'll talk about that as well. But sort of in summary, what that means is that you go into the process with some type of hypothesis, that you have an idea of what your outcome is going to be and what it's going to look like. Now, when you talk about evidence-based practice, there are actually criteria out there to help you um, factor in important elements before moving forward. Now, the first is that it's based on empirical evidence, right? And like I said earlier, that's really based on having some type of hypothesis. Sometimes I feel like the easiest way to understand this is to have a a better picture of what a research process looks like. And what's important to note is when you're talking about research or evaluation, um, the process looks very similar. I mean, there's some distinct differences, but I tried to simplify the process for you here. Um, and so you'll see that in the very first category where you begin is you identify a question that your organization really wants to ask. Um, it may be specific to a practice that um, has been implemented or at least that you're thinking about implementing. It may be a question about a particular program that's already in place. Um, the second part is reviewing the literature. What's already out there? What do we know? Number three is very important. <clears throat> and this is where the empirical evidence comes into play. It's this idea of developing a hypothesis. What do you think will happen by implementing this practice or implementing this program? So I'll give you an example. My hypothesis may be um, by implementing co-location services, there will, be there will be a positive impact on domestic violence survivors. So that is a hypothesis, right? It's clear in that we think there's going to be a positive impact because of implementing these types of services that we'll talk about in more detail in a second. But we want to be really clear. So when I say impact, how am I defining that? We need to clarify. So would impact, would positive impact look, at, look like um, both DV advocates and child welfare practitioners have an increased knowledge of each other's role and ability and the skills that they bring to the table? Absolutely, that could be a way of defining it. Another way is to say, well, maybe case practice changes. Maybe if we implement co-location services and collaboration occurs between these groups and trust and collaborative efforts occur, maybe there'll be less victim blaming in cases because there'll be a greater understanding of the domestic violence field and uh, risk and protective factors of any survivor. So those are just examples of elements that you want to bring into a hypothesis. You want to be as specific as possible, because that really um, instructs you on how to move forward to number four, which is actually developing your research design. How will you go about testing um, what you plan to look at? 
will, um, you know, ideally, if you're looking at, at evidence-based practice, you would like your work to really focus on a true, a true experimental design or some type of quasi-experimental design, which means that the researcher or the organization that's working on this program has a way of manipulating a variable. And so what that could look like is you may implement a service or a program, but you may not um, have it available to all your survivors or all your clients. So half of the group gets the program, and the other group may get some other type of program or may not get anything at all. Um, but at least you have a comparison group. And that really falls into number two about the criteria for evidence-based practices. It has to do with experimental design and this idea of random assignment. So anybody who comes into the office has an equal chance of being selected. They have an equal chance of being in one of those groups. Um, either the group that's receiving the treatment or uh, a control group, but part of the process. Um, sections five and six as part of the research process really focus on data collection, who's going to help you collect it, how are you going to analyze it, and how are you going to share your findings with others. It's really important that that information gets spread not only to your internal staff and the organization, but there's probably some collaborative partners that are really interested in that information as well. The last component of the research process, and I, I have to put a caveat here, this figure is very simplified. There's um, other categories that we can bring in at any time, um, but I felt these were the most important um, to explain to you. So number seven is this idea of replication. Um, what's important is that your findings are replicated across locations. So in more than one setting, in more than one jurisdiction, ideally in more than one state, um, with very limited change to the program. And the fourth criteria is that it results in a peer-reviewed publication. Now, the reason peer-reviewed journal articles are important is because they go through a very, they go through an extra level of scrutiny. Scrutiny. Um, they bring in experts who um, really know the content in which you wrote about, um, can review it independently. It's usually a blind process, which means that the person who's reviewing your publication doesn't know you're attached to it. Your um, name and affiliation are removed so that it eliminates any type of bias when um, uh, making a recommendation as to whether the publication should be published or not. Um, some more information about this general research process as it relates to evidence-based practice can be found on our website, and the link is provided down below there. Those are free webinars that have uh, taken place in the past um, but have been recorded for you. So why is it important to measure the effectiveness on a continuum? So what we've learned is the literature on evidence-based practice, while it's growing, and it, it definitely has grown over the last decade, it's still quite limited. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that um, in a minute. Our gold standard of evaluation is still that it results in an evidence-based practice, right? And that's, of course, ideal. But we need to acknowledge that the fields of domestic violence and child welfare, as uh, as many as, as well as other systems often lack resources and funding um, and time to support these types of efforts. So um, measuring effectiveness can be quite challenging. A good way of starting, though, is considering these SMART goals. I'm sure you're familiar with them, just the idea that um, your goals and objectives moving forward with some type of evaluation need to be specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be obtainable, right? You want everything to be realistic. Um, you want information to be relevant so that you can take that information back in a short period of time to your collaborative partners um, and explain what you found. And the T really represents some type of being, you know, really being time-bound or time-sensitive to your results. 
When I work with courts across the nation, I really encourage them to make three types of goals or objectives. One is a short-term goal, something that is completely doable, say, within three to four months. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be low-hanging fruit, but it needs to be something um, that's accomplishable um, and to really lift um, organization morale and to show that even in a short time something can occur. Now, of course, there's intermediate and long-term goals that um, come into play there and, and can be decided. Um, sometimes those long-term goals um, have more to do with evidence-based practice than those short-term goals because collecting this data and evaluating these programs is time-consuming. Some other important components to think about is that when you think of evidence-based practice, they're often very specific to populations. Um, much of the research isn't focused on underserved populations. There's a limitation there. So there's definitely more research um, that's needed in this field. Going back to practice-based evidence and how it intersects with EBTs is that it's really a starting point. Practice-based evidence really helps us to identify promising or emerging practices or programs, some which in the future may very well lead to evidence-based practice. But what practice-based evidence gives us is an opportunity. So there are opportunities for improvement, for adaption, and for implementation. I apologize, I think I skipped. Forgive me, I skipped a slide. Um, so one of the resources that I wanted to make you aware of is a publication that actually came out of the National Council. It's uh, titled Moving Toward Evidence-Based Practices. It's a publication that's available through our website um, or a hard copy via an email to us. The goal of this publication is really to help programs identify where they are in the process, um, to document their empirical evidence to support the effectiveness of their efforts. The guide is really meant to be informative. It's to help you determine your current readiness to evalu evaluate your program in practice. It's also to help you move forward with an evaluation when you're ready to do so. And so this guide really coincides with the continuum of evidence for effectiveness. It's really based on that. And so some of the examples um, that the guide gives you is um, clear and direct questions and how to categorize them having to do with organizational resources for evaluation. I said this earlier, and much of the time people think that this is very true. In some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. It isn't. But um, much of the time you have more resources via your organization or through collaborative partners than you think you do. So we've created a very simple worksheet to go through about yes or no's, what you have available, and how you can move forward. There's also specific questions about assessing programs and practices. and. Um, a worksheet on developing an evaluation plan and the types of questions you should think about when preparing to do so, um, as well as the importance of differences between process and formative evaluations. Um, so um, we can make sure that all of this information is available to you after the, web, after the webinar. And another thing I want to highlight is that um, once you review this guide, council staff is available to you to help you move through the process. We're a training and technical assistance provider um, that can talk you through this via conference calls or site visits. So it's just something to keep in mind. So when we're thinking about evidence-based practice, what do, what do common practices look like and what does the literature tell us? So um, a guide that came out through the National Council um, a couple decades ago was, it's commonly known as the Green Book, Effective Interventions in Domestic and Child 
domestic violence and child maltreatment cases. It's really a guide for policy and practices. What this publication really promotes, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it, is this need to strengthen an understanding and capacity among individuals who are serving families who have experienced both of these um, these issues, both domestic violence and child maltreatment. What I chose to do is give you some examples about some cross-system collaboration that was really key to the conversation in the Green Book and heavily promoted. So these are contemporary examples of what cross-system collaboration may look like. We'll be talking about co-location services, multidisciplinary teams, and coordinated community responses. So co-location services, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this. It's really the idea that a domestic violence advocate and uh, child protective service staff are both housed in the same office. We know that we know that the literature has told us for some time that the intersection between domestic violence and child maltreatment, the co-occurrence there, is quite high. Literature suggests that it can range anywhere from 30% to 60%. So it makes a lot of sense for us to want to have domestic violence advocates and child protective service professionals um, chatting with one another on a consistent and regular basis. So really the goal or objective of um, co-location services is for DV advocates to be readily available to assess CPS staff when a case comes through that involves domestic violence. So what does the literature tell us? Some interesting work is being done out of New York, for example. Uh, they collected some data on the effectiveness of co-location services. Um, the literature, the peer-reviewed literature, um, is actually quite limited on this topic, which I was surprised by. Um, but there were some interesting findings out of the Center for Human Resources research. And they're attached to um, SUNY in New York. So they examined the impact the actual impact of co-locating um, these professionals in one office. Some positive outcomes came as a result. We know that um, the data showed that the knowledge of both domestic violence advocates and child protective uh, caseworkers increased, so they had a better understanding of what the other professional did and what they brought to the table. We know that there were some positive case practices that really revolved from implementing co-location services. One was that there was less victim blaming language um, in the petitions that moved forward um, because um, both uh, professionals had a better understanding of what that victim and or survivor really went through. <clears throat> Another example is that domestic violence was less likely to be used as the sole reason for a case to be substantiated and moved forward. So that those are critical examples of how co-location can play a key role here. Some additional findings also showed that there was an improved coordination between the fields, so they were actively working together uh, to make sure that both survivors and offenders were connected to the services they needed. Let's talk a little bit about multidisciplinary teams. I would imagine that um, many of you are familiar with co-location services, but also familiar with multidisciplinary teams. Uh, in brief, what they are are groups of professionals from really varied fields that work together to provide comprehensive services to their clients. So these individuals really work together to decide on the next steps for their clients, um, regardless of what door they come into. So regardless of um, whether they're being assisted by CPS or DV advocates um, or um, other collaborative partners. So what we know about multidisciplinary teams is that they typically meet on a regular basis, um, usually um, weekly or every other week. They have a set group of individuals that come into play, um, and they're working on individual cases specifically to move those forward. Um, an example that comes to mind is 
um, we worked with several jurisdictions um, that have really wanted to focus on dual status youth. Um, and those are individuals that fall into the child welfare system, but also fall under the juvenile justice system. So um, they kind of hover within both of those systems. And so we've worked with many family courts and juvenile justice courts to uh, gather data and to help them build multidisciplinary teams that bring all the key players to the table. In that example, we may have CPS, probation, uh, mental health professionals, court-appointed special advocates, um, school representatives, um, parents and kids all at the table as part of this. But let's talk a little bit about what the research says about um, the impact of multidisciplinary teams. Now, what we found was that there was limited research that really focused on domestic violence and child welfare. Um, so this was example number one focused on um, a multidisciplinary team that um, really focused on child abuse and detecting whether or not abuse occurred um, within referrals. It was a hospital-based setting, and um, there were some positive outcomes that came out of this literature. So what they showed was as many as 7% of cases referred to this special MDT <clears throat> were classified as non-abusive. And so what does that tell us? It tells us that the referral to this MDT really eliminated a false positive of abuse. And um, the MDT did two things. One, it eliminated time and costs associated with Child Protective Services and the investigations that are attached to that. And that it also prevented removing a child from his or home her home in these incidences, which is fantastic because we know of the traumas and the negative consequences attached to children that are um, even introduced to our systems of care. Forgive me, my computer is a little slow. The second example is a completely separate study. Um, they looked at, uh, they really examined the communication of multidisciplinary team members who were attached to child advocacy centers. Uh, what was unique about this particular study was that they were using a web-based information system, so um, an internet-based uh, tracking system that uh, anybody who was part of the MDT had access to. A positive outcome of this was that they saw that um, MDT members definitely saved time re uh, retrieving case information because they were going to a centralized database. So they saw some positive um, results of really everyone gathering the same type of information and having one source of that information regardless of what role you fell um, on that team. One limitation that they acknowledged in this study, however, was that only certain members of the multidisciplinary team were able to enter the information into the system. So everybody had access to read the information, but not everybody had access to go in there and alter the information. Um, regardless, um, it appears that there was um, some time-saving um, efforts noted in that particular study, which are important and um, uh, crucial to highlight. The last set of literature that we're going to talk about today is coordinated community responses. And so CCRs really stem from an ecological approach to helping victims of intimate partner violence. Um, a CCR typically consists of local service providers who work together in a response to IPV. So once something occurred, there's already a protocol in place to how each member of a CCR will respond in an organized and synchronized manner to properly um, uh, respond to the needs of a survivor. 
And so this is an example of a CCR. Of course, it can get way more complex, but the red bubble in the middle identifies the victim of intimate partner violence or domestic violence, and surrounding it is some of the resources that are available. But without communicating to one another, they may react very differently uh, when trying to assist this victim. Some possible members of a CCR are law enforcement, uh, enforcement officers. We, obviously, we often see first responders being key to CCRs and their effectiveness. Um, healthcare providers, child protection services, uh, domestic violence advocates, educators, um, faith-based leaders. So with CCRs, what's fantastic is that we often see jurisdictions reaching out to non-traditional groups to play an active role in the responses here. So in comparison to the information that I presented on co-located services and MDTs, there's a bit more literature available on CCRs. But it's clear that we still need more. So let's talk about some examples and what's out there right now. So the first example I have for you is um, a study um, published in 2010 that really examined the impact of two things. One, an individual's knowledge and attitude about intimate partner violence. And the second is a reduction in intimate partner violence once a CCR was um, added to their community resources. So what the authors did was compare three different types of communities. Uh, the first community was a CCR that had been implemented within you know, three years of data collection. One had been implemented six years since data collection, and then they had control sites um, that didn't have CCRs attached to them. In regards to the outcomes, they saw that, interestingly, that the CCRs didn't make an impact on communities' members, their knowledge, or their exposure to IPV, or their awareness of uh, local services to address these issues. Um, so across the board, that was the general finding, which was pretty interesting. It's different than other literature out there that shows CCRs to be effective. Um, an important outcome, though, of this study is that they showed some differences. Um, as I said earlier, there were three different groups. The ones who had CCRs within the th three years CCRs within six years, and then the control group. What they found was that there's some support for long-term impact of CCRs. The women in communities with the CCR that had been around for six years were um, less likely to report any types of aggression against them when being reevaluated um, at a later point in the process. Um, and that was significantly different than communities that didn't have CCRs or that had CCRs um, implemented just in a, in a shorter period of time. So it does suggest that sometimes efforts really need to be in place for a period of time to see some results. Another study that I wanted to highlight um, came out in 2014. And what this really was was a review of the literature. Um, so the researchers went out to investigate how are, CC use, how are CCRs used across disciplines. Are they, are they something really specific to the domestic violence and child welfare fields? What the findings showed us is that they are being implemented, but there isn't much literature out for other fields. So there's significantly more um, literature on the benefits of CCRs when you're coming from an advocacy perspective or a counseling perspective, um, and the importance of everybody around the table um, really being on the same page to best serve their client. Um, but when you look at fields like criminal justice um, or child services alone, maybe healthcare um, or vocational and educational education fields, the literature was very limited. So like our conversation about co-location services and MDTs, what we know here is that we need to examine our programs and practices more. 
um, there's, um, we're really in our infancy um, in understanding what works and what doesn't work. So that really leads us to our next question. Um, if you are attached to an organization who's interested in evaluating your programs, practices, or policies, there are groups in the community that can help. And the National Council is definitely one of them. I wanted to provide you with some resources. So you'll find that um, on the left, in the left column. Um, these are some great resources just to get you started um, through, the C, through the CDC. Uh, they've put um, an eval action um, a page up that um, is interactive. It can clarify some myths out there about evaluation and give you direction about how to move forward. Like I said earlier, the Resource Center on Domestic Violence, Child Protection, and Custody is also available. Uh, we have staff here that are trained in research and evaluation and help, can help you from start to finish on some of these practices. And then there's some great work being done by our colleagues um, at the National Resource on Domestic Violence. The Domestic Violence Evidence-Based Program has some wonderful literature reviews that I encourage, you, encourage that you access, um, as well as some templates on um, how to move forward with an evaluation. And then that last component is uh, through Casa de Esperanza, so the National Latino Network with their focus on healthy families and communities really focused on developing a, cool, a toolkit with assistance from their local collaborative partners. Um, and so they played a great hand in developing the resources that are available to underserved populations. The next column to your right is some example of registries that are available that you can go to to get a better handle on evidence-based programs that are already being critiqued and published. Um, I'm a huge fan of the clearing of the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse for Child Welfare. Um, it does have some domestic violence uh, programs and practices listed, but of course the focus tends to be child welfare. Um, but it tells you every step of the process um, in regards to sort of on their continuum of effectiveness where um, programs like the Duluth model fall, for example, and what type of literature is out there on those types of um, uh, programs. SAMHSA um, also has a registry for evidence-based programs and practices that's listed there. Um, there's the Center for Study. Uh, and prevention of violence. And then NIJ has crime solutions um, that also list different types of treatments that are readily available. Um, and all of these registries are really focused on highlighting evidence-based practice and promoting, promoting these efforts uh, to have them move forward. So, um, I apologize, that was a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, I hope it was digestible. Um, but please know that staff here from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges is readily available to assist. My contact information is listed here. Please feel free to reach out to me directly via email or phone um, if you have questions um, or need some further assistance. But I'd love to open it up to um, any questions at this time. I think we still have about five minutes or so before we wrap up the webinar. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into that chat box. We see a few people typing. Um, yeah, so one of the primary questions that we are always asked is, um, will we have access to this PowerPoint afterwards? Yes. Um, Alicia will, um, well, actually, the PowerPoint is available under materials right now. It's the box un directly under the chat box, and you can click on that and download it. Um, immediately. If you'd like to hear a copy of this recording, that's going to be made available probably later in the week 
um, and Alicia tends to send that out via email to everybody who's um, registered for uh, this webinar. Um, I don't see any other um, questions coming through at this time. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you directly. Please, I really encourage all of you to reach out to the National Council. We're a great resource that's um, free and readily available to all of you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia for some closing remarks. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we'll wait just a couple more minutes and keep the room open in case more people have questions. But I did want to direct you to the evaluation. The link is in the web link box just below the PowerPoint. Um, let us know how, you, how we did today, what we can include in future webinars. And you will also have an opportunity at the evaluation link to request a certificate of attendance for today's event. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, have a fantastic day. Bye-bye.